Good. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, uh, a very warm welcome. And if you're just coming in, uh, please, please come in, come join us. We're going to have a really intimate conversation in a minute about taxation. Uh, I think everybody is interested in taxation. And generally, most people I know think somebody else should be paying more. <laughs> so we might have a conversation about how we get to a situation where we all feel comfortable about what we're paying uh, and we feel comfortable about what other people are paying um, and we feel comfortable about what corporations are paying and we feel comfortable about where that tax revenue is ultimately going. Um, if you are watching from home or in the office and you want to participate in the conversation we're going to have, then I understand that you can access the Slido system. Um, there is a QR code that you can scan, so please do that if you have the facilities to do that, or you can access uh, via hashtag WEF22, and I will try and get your questions in before we wrap up the panel. Um, I'll have a go. We've got a lot of ground to cover. Hopefully, we will, do, we will do that successfully, and we will all leave the room, as I like to say, smarter than we came in. So I want you to be involved as much as I want my panellists to be involved, and I'll get an introduction to the panel in just a moment. But I want to ask you a very quick, quick question, if you can just give me a show of hands. I think this format works very well to find out what the mood of the room is, and it helps the panel to understand um, the kind of audience that they're working with here. So my question to you is this. There was a huge fanfare last year around what we thought was going to be a global tax deal at 15% that was going to be implemented sooner rather than later. That deal has not yet been implemented. It represented a significant breakthrough in a multilateral approach to global taxation. My question to you, the audience, is do you think that tax deal is going to get implemented? Can you raise your hand if you think the deal will ultimately get implemented. Okay, not bad. I think that's, that's, I would say that's a little over half of the room if you're um, watching from home. Let, let me ask the inverse. Who thinks that deal won't get implemented? If you could raise your hand. Okay, well, that's less hands, but that's still a significant number of hands. So thank you very much for giving us a sense of where you sit on this whole conversation. Um, let me introduce our panel then, um, because I think we're going to have a, a, a terrific um, range of opinions, if I might put it that way, as to where taxes should be levied and ultimately who those taxes should benefit. Um, so let me start uh, by just talking uh, about um, uh, our panel. If I can introduce uh, Gabriella uh, Butcher. Thank you so much for being with us, Executive Director at Oxfam International. Um, to end extreme inequality, we must call on world leaders to end the era of tax havens. Um, that's a starting point. That's a direct quote from you. I think that lets the audience know what your perspective is at this stage. Um, Matthias Korman, thank you for being with us. OECD Secretary General, um, someone who's been a driving force behind the um, ideas that have pushed forward this, uh, this global tax agenda. But you said agreement without implementation is de facto no agreement. Would you be pleased, I think, to see that a lot of the audience thinks that we will get implementation, but we'll get your opinion on that in just a moment. Uh, and just to keep us honest, as we think about the fairness aspect versus the efficiency of taxation, uh, Stephanie uh, uh, Stanch Stancheva is with us, uh, Professor of Economics at Harvard University. Um, tax is politicised and impacts innovation, both corporate and individual. So there's clearly a balance, as you point out, that we need to achieve here where tax doesn't hold back progress. So we'll get some of your opinions on that. So thank you um, for being with us. Uh, Matthias, if I might start with you, because I think this is um, important. Can you give us a sit rep, a status update as to where you think we are now in the passage of this international tax agreement? Uh, so Firstly, I mean, it was a historic and very important uh, deal that was reached um, in October last year, but it was always going to be the case that after the in-principle agreement had been reached, a lot of technical work uh, 
had to be done on both pillars. Pillar one requires a multilateral uh, instrument, a multilateral treaty. Uh, pillar two uh, is essentially implemented through domestic uh, legislation, but required uh, things like you know, template legislation, guidelines, and so on. All of the technical work in relation to pillar two from our end has been completed, and it's now up to individual uh, jurisdictions uh, to proceed with implementation, and, and we're very encouraged. I mean, as we um, meet here today, uh, EU finance ministers are meeting uh, to uh, discuss the directive uh, that was put forward very swiftly uh, by the European Commission to implement uh, Pillar 2. Uh, in Switzerland, they're proceeding with uh, changes to the constitution in order to be able to implement uh, this deal. Canada, the UK, I mean, all around uh, the world, uh, countries are proceeding with the implementation. And the truth is, one, once you have a critical mass um, of countries that impose a minimum level of uh, corporate tax on profits generated, uh, in their jurisdictions, uh, then really um, it, it becomes very hard not to become part of it because, I mean, essentially you leave money on the table for other countries to collect mm -hmm. if you don't uh, align yourself to that global standard. In relation to Pillar 1, look, I mean, there's still some uh, d this, uh, difficult discussions uh, underway in, in relation to some of the technical aspects. Initially, we had hoped to be in a position to um, finalize the multilateral agreement mm -hmm. um, by the middle of this year. We think that that is now more likely to be by the end of this year. We, we do hope, though, that in time uh, for the G20 finance ministers meeting uh, in Bali in July, that we will have in principle agreement on all of the uh, remaining technical uh, aspects. But then, I mean, there will be the drafting uh, and, you know, the dotting of the I's and the crossing of the T's. Uh, but, I mean, look, I, I'm quietly optimistic. Um, you know, we, we deliberately set a very ambitious timeline for implementation initially to keep the pressure on. Um, and um, I, I mean, we think that that has helped keep the momentum going. Uh, but um, I, I suspect we, it's probably most likely now that we'll uh, end up with, with a practical implementation from 2024 onwards. The most obvious speed hump at the moment seems to be the midterm elections uh, and whether uh, Congress is returned Republican. Um, uh, it does appear that uh, if the Republicans are in the House, then as far as the Americans are concerned, it, it won't get passed. Can, can the Europeans proceed without the Americans on board, given <coughs> the taxing of American technology companies seem to be an important element of the deal? Uh, look, I'm, I'm obviously not going to uh, get myself involved in commentary on the internal uh, democratic processes of, of, of any uh, country or, or the politics of it. But what, what I would say is that rationally, I mean, I, I do believe that in the end, self-interest does prevail. Um, and as far as Pillar 1 is concerned, I just can't see uh, that uh, large uh, American multinationals would prefer to be on the receiving end of a proliferation of different tax regimes to try and address uh, the, the, the real equity issues uh, you know, that we saw uh, you know, emerging around the world where large companies were not paying uh, their fair share of tax in jurisdictions in which they generated uh, profits. Now, um, in relation to Pillar 2, um, it just won't make sense for countries not to implement the arrangement if there is a sufficient number of countries around the world that have this minimum tax in place and are able to uh, essentially collect the gap uh, between, between I mean, any lower level of tax and the 15%. So, I mean, I think that it, it will become self-perpetuating and, and I'm, I'm quietly confident that when it's all said and done, uh, that rational thinking and self-interest, uh, will, will, the pursuit of self-interest will prevail. Just before I broaden out the, the conversation, the world has changed a lot since October of 2021. Trust is in very short supply. Do you think this was a, an attempt at a multilateral deal too far, given how the world's changed since then? Not, not at all. I mean, I think it was uh, an example of um, a multilateralism working. I mean, some people will say, you know, it should have been... Um, it should have gone further. Some people will say it's, it's not, it's gone too far. But, but in the end, there was a, a, a balance found that, that was able to get 94% of the global economy uh, around a consensus position. And I mean, I, I don't think that was, has happened since then, as awful as some of that is, has got any uh, connection to uh, you know, d this particular uh, multilateral agreement. Gabriella, this, this was all about coming up with or reimagining a, a global tax system. Um, was this ever the right deal, in your opinion? 
So I think reimagining a tax system, which is also the name of our session, is important. Uh, we would say the imagination didn't go far enough, but um, it was eight years of negotiations. As you said, it's, it's complex negotiations, and, and tax, obviously, is, is a process that will take time. Um, and, and as you say, the world moves on and, and different factors come into play. And it was, of course, um, mostly, you know, the OECD played a, a big part and, of course, OECD members. There was an inclusive framework to include many other countries. So it's a global tax deal. But as you yourself are talking about some of the, um, you know, largest economies, the idea would have been for it to be a, a f truly fair and inclusive tax deal that would have um, um, really brought revenues to those least developed countries. So if uh, in pillar two, um, the percentage, the tax uh, rate had been higher at 25%, which was actually what was uh, recommended by, by groups of tax experts the world over, and actually connects with the rates in, in, some, of the, in some of the economies that are participating in the deal, then 17 billion more um, dollars would be raised in, for the developing world, for least developed countries and middle-income countries, than is the case now with the 15%. So 15% is too low, and, and it's driven by, by um, some of the tax havens that actually are, are pulling down. So, you know, on the positive side, of course, it's closing loopholes on tax havens. And as you said from my quote at the beginning, that we believe that's extremely important. Um, and that's, that's good, but um, we, we are worried that this will be a race to the bottom, um, a further race to the bottom in terms of corporate taxation, um, and, and countries that have higher rates might go down. And what we know uh, from previous um, you know, critical moment uh, experienced by the whole world in World War II, taxes were raised significantly and corporate taxation in the US was very high and it was kept being very high for many years and that coincided with high growth periods. So I'm sure the professor can speak of that in, in greater detail, but um, there's a danger that we're not really using this important tool at this moment when we have so many competing crises and really um, increasing fiscal space for countries to be able to invest on, on the most affected populations and those uh, that are really at the, at the bottom of, of the society and, and who need, and in reality now we're talking about a hunger crisis with 193 million people in severe hunger situations in, across the world, but including in the rich world where many people are talking about skipping meals and not having enough to live. So there needs to be a resource mobilization to deal with those situations, those extreme situations that, that we're living now. So we believe that we need to continue in the discussion on the ambition for the, the corporate tax deal and other taxes that hopefully we can also speak about. But it's very important that we have this session here at the World Economic Forum. Um, I think it's the only one on tax, and I believe we should have more um, because, you know, people ask, you know, there's a lot of dialogue, lots of discussions at, at WEF. It's important, but then what happens in practice? And something that can really change things is, is tax. And we, you know, from our perspective on addressing the growing and huge inequalities um, in the world, progressive taxation is a tool at every country's disposal to really address inequality. And of course, it requires social uh, contract, rethinking uh, society and, and what things mean for, for different actors in society and why one should pay taxes and what the transparency levels need to be in order for people to trust and to be able to know that those investments in public services, public goods, mm education, health, everything that is actually going to increase living standards, well-being, is paid by, by taxes. Let, let's be very, very real about where we are, though, um, currently in the global economy. We uh, have just had two years of a, of a pandemic that's, that's reframed the way we think about international cooperation. And actually, a lot of good things came out of countries having to work together to tackle a global pandemic. And yet we seem to have squandered that goodwill and that ability to work together as we're now what appears to be heading into a, a recession or a, a serious slowdown for the global economy. Is there any chance at all that governments are going to say our priority actually is not managing our domestic economic challenges, it's raising taxation to provide help for those who are being left behind in other countries? 
So I, mean, I, I hate to put it brutally no, in those terms, but you know, <clears> if, they, if they didn't get the help then, are they going to get the help now right. with so many more challenges for governments to manage? It actually wasn't a, an issue of help or charity. It was an issue of justice in terms of taxation in the countries where companies were doing their business and also other companies from those countries. So it's not about help. You know, that's additional. And there's other, there would be other conversations that we could have about aid or, or, or debt cancellation, which are also um, should be very much on the agenda given the situation, but um, it's about also disenfranchised and marginalised populations in, in the global north, in rich countries as well. So taxation and mobilising resources are required both in, in advanced economies and across the global south. Um, do we have a, 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 an appreciation of our tax systems being fair at this stage? but also providing incentive? That's a great question. Um, the, the lens through which I want to look at it is actually how, how people think about this, how citizens view this. Um, you know, one of, one of my guiding principles has been that we need to listen more to people. Um, we, you know, academics, but also business leaders, policy makers, we need to better understand how people actually reason and uh, perceive these core economic policies. And this is why in my lab at Harvard, the social economics lab, we ran large scale surveys and experiments across different countries to try and really get into people's minds, so to speak, and see what are their perceptions, attitudes, fairness concerns, reasoning about policies like taxation. And what we can see on taxation is that we care about a lot of things. Of course, we care about the economic costs of taxes, so what, what taxes will do to economic activities. And we citizens also care about our views of the government and whether we think the government can be trusted to handle taxes and waste the revenues or not. But what turns out to be the most important concern that sort of swamps everything else is what we think about who wins, who loses from a given tax change and how fair we think that is. That dominates other concerns. So to put it very simply, people don't support different levels of taxes, whether on people or corporations, because they have different views about what the economic costs of these taxes are. They support different levels of taxes because they have very different views of who the winners and losers are and how fair that is. And someone who thinks taxes have high economic costs may still want high taxes because they care a lot about inequality. And so we economists are at this intersection where we can say which policies are economically efficient, um, but then we have to also take into account which policies are perceived to be fair. And I can tell you about two uh, policies that are sort of in this conjunction among others. Uh, one is actually the uh, global, something like the global tax deal to actually get at multinational taxation. And the other is about actually improving tax enforcement overall, even domestically. Um, and happy to talk more about those. Yeah, details. no, please carry on. I think we're fascinated. So on the, on the taxing of multinationals, it is truly both an efficiency issue and a fairness issue. On the efficiency side, you know, there's a lot of untapped revenues there that um, are, are just not uh, raised by any government. And then there's issues of certainty and uh, you know, stability for businesses, which currently are facing a sort of labyrinth of either double taxes or non-taxes and constant changes. And it's also a big fairness issue because people think very strongly that there's winners and losers from globalization and you know, are willing to support openness and globalization. Many studies show that if they think that the losers will be compensated fairly. And companies, large companies especially, are definitely perceived to be among the big winners from globalization. And COVID has only exacerbated that view because there's this idea that companies get helped when times are tough by governments uh, through various policies and so should be paying into the, the common pool um, the taxes that they have to pay uh, when times are good. So it is this mix of efficiency you know, concerns and also fairness concerns. And the other is on the enforcement, improving tax administration itself within countries. There's a lot of fiscal leakages and um, there's a big fairness concern that everyone should pay the taxes they're supposed to pay, whatever the level, low or high. And there's a lot of uh, evidence and also uh, perception among citizens that tax evasion and avoidance doesn't happen equally across the income distribution and equally across companies of different sizes. And here there's a lot to do to leverage actually the new data analytics tools that we have, big data methods, also based on research that is progressing so fast 
and use of real-time data to really improve tax enforcement, but also very simply, actually simply giving funds to the severely underfunded and overcommitted tax administrations in many countries uh, to simply be able to also recruit, uh, train, and retain talent. And so that's another area where you know, the efficiency concerns and fairness concerns actually really coincide very well. So those are two examples. Yeah, no, that's fascinating. So, but, but one of the challenges then clearly is transparency, as, as we know going forward, and it's a point that, that you've raised. Um, does it make sense for us then to be thinking more seriously about a global asset register or, or indeed moving forward the UN tax convention where we focus much more clearly on reporting and transparency? Well, <clears throat> at the OECD level, I mean, we do have a global forum that is focused precisely on this tax transparency issue. And in recent years, uh, we've made a lot of progress in terms of exchange of information uh, between jurisdictions where, where that was not the case before to really help facilitate uh, that, that enforcement. And, 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 you know, we're also very focused uh, on supporting developing economies in terms of their capability their, their capability uh, development in terms of raising their own source revenue. I mean, so there's a whole range of areas in this space that, that we are active to improve transparency, to improve the level of exchange of information, and to, to help um, and to support uh, developing economies in particular in terms of the way they uh, are able uh, to raise their own source revenue. But how do we overcome the tax haven challenge? I mean, there's right. been a lot of movement on it, but do, uh, do we ultimately, is this about public shaming? Do you embarrass companies and billionaires and countries into ultimately improving transparency? Well, I mean, over the last 10 years or so, over the last 10 plus years, through the base erosion, uh, profit shifting, the BEPS action plan, I mean, we've addressed a lot of these issues. Um, like, I mean, you know, in, in the end, obviously, we uh, are committed uh, to uh, a system where the rule of law prevails. Uh, and, and you, you work within appropriate democratic uh, rules of law uh, based by systems. But we, need, we do need to ensure that the tax administrations around the world have the proper tools and, and the, the proper um, information and access to the proper information to enforce their tax laws. Gabriela. So I agree. And, and what has happened has been obviously globalization happening at speed, uh, but tax, the tax systems haven't. Um, been developed at the same pace. So tax systems have been national level, while corporations are increasingly complex, intertwined, um, global entities. So this corporate tax deal goes some way into that. But of course, the levels of complexity are, are so high, and, and the difficulty of, of taxation is, is also very high. So there we have a lot of work to do in that area. But in the terms of, um, of transparency and, and tax havens, we have a long way to go on on wealth from individuals. So we've been talking a lot from corporate taxation, but we really, we, we advocate and, and there's been a launch of doing an asset registry of, of individuals mm -hmm. and to have transparency. And in fact, it should be in the interest of all those who have acquired even very large amounts. And in fact, it's known and those lists are known by everyone, those who have acquired um, large um, amounts of wealth legally and, you know, at the moment, because of the levels of secrecy and, and lack of transparency, all those um, assets are combined in, in secrecy. So it's in, in, the, in the interest of all to know. And that's the beginning. And in fact, when we talk about wealth taxation of individuals, we talk, it's very small percentages, really, that we're talking about. And the countries that have wealth taxes implemented, 1%, 2% taxation, very small for that individual, but given the, the it had, has enormous impact um, for, for society. And it redresses the balance that at the moment, taxation is mostly focused on consumption, which is not a progressive tax at all, and on income. And uh, of course, people who have salaries, we get taxed regardless, um, but not all countries are as progressive as they could be in income taxation. So that would be, if you, the more progressive you are, the more you can, uh, have an impact on reducing inequality and, and raising revenues for programs that help um, social protection, health education. So, so the issue is there's only, at the, in 2017, the figure was only 4% of total tax revenue came from wealth taxation. Mm. So in terms of reimagining tax systems, we think there's huge scope there to work on mobilizing resources that are needed 
both in, in rich economies and um, in the global south, uh, absolutely urgently, given all the crises that we have. And we know it takes a long time to, to develop these things, but these conversations need to happen at national level. Several countries have them. There used to be more countries that had them, and, and we need to go back and probably you can talk about what the trade-offs are, but um, we see mostly positives in, in this path, including the transparency and, and bringing society together and, and building trust by, by also and, and solidarity. It's a very active conversation, we know, uh, and Janet Yellen is talking a lot about taxes on unrealised gains that, that billionaires on, and millionaires hold. What does uh, the academic study tell us about the effect of levying those taxes on the wealthy when it comes to what progress then society makes and how those people use their finances going forward? Because at the moment, a lot of them just relocate to another country with a different tax base. <coughs> These are very difficult questions because actually, you know, at the scale of history, there haven't been that many wealth taxes that we can, that we can study. Uh, and they're not necessarily in comparable places or in historic periods that we can compare it to today. But um, I do think that this global tax agreement is very much in the spirit that it's broader of taxing capital better. Uh, at the scale of the world. Um, that is a very big challenge because capital is so mobile, it's easy to you know, hide in, in various places. And so I think the developments that go a little bit hand in hand with that, such um, as the uh, automatic exchange of information between countries, are really critical to actually allow better enforcement and sort of lower the cost of actually um, taxing capital. And I do think this is particularly crucial after COVID or during COVID, uh, as we're still in it, because COVID has really exacerbated inequalities along pretty much all dimensions, not just across income the income distribution, but also between genders, between children from different backgrounds, very starkly, between different sectors, between different regions within countries. And there is definitely, you know, existing fractures that have been amplified and deepened. And so the urgency somehow is even you know, is even more pressing than before to address these. But of the um, taxes that could be levied, I mean, obviously we could talk about wealth taxes, but there are taxes on consumption, as you pointed out, inheritance taxes, or, uh, taxes on um, all, all sorts of things. What, what are most efficient, or which are most efficient, and actually um, least um, uh, negative in terms of the kind of innovation that you've been focused on? If I could answer that, there would be no more public economics field. Um, this is definitely a quite, quite complex topic. It is more about, for each of these type of taxes that we have, actually improving the way they're levied. And it's not necessarily about taxing more, depends on the context, but really about taxing better. Uh, all of these taxes have a lot of inefficiency embedded in them currently. And so I mentioned a few related to general tax enforcement or multinational companies or on the taxation of capital. And so I think that is, that is something unambiguous that we can say uh, to improve that. Uh, Mateus, I mean, we, we, we saw uh, Jeff Bezos push back uh, against President Biden's uh, connection of taxation and inflation. Um, does the fact that we're now seeing these conversations played out in the public domain suggest that actually any legislation in the United States that puts higher taxes on billionaires is dead, is dead in the water? Well, look, I mean, I, I think debates on taxation uh, are not uh, new. Uh, they've always, it's always been thus, and they've always been uh, a central part of the political uh, discourse. Um, I mean, what I, what I would say, clearly governments need to be able to raise uh, the necessary revenue to fund the public services uh, their populations require and expect. Um, I, ideally, they should do so in a way that is uh, most efficient, least distorting in the economy, and is fair and equitable. Uh, the question then is how can you, you know, how, how can you have the Goldilocks approach to taxation that gives you uh, taxes that are uh, as most efficient, least distorting, and fair and equitable, and seen as being fair and equitable. And and look, um, you know, as far as wealth taxes uh, are concerned, I mean, I, we haven't seen a, a huge history of success on the efficiency and least distorting front when it comes to those. I mean, they're inevitably uh, difficult to administer uh, and don't necessarily raise um, uh, that much revenue, is, is the evidence. It's true that on the perceived fairness and equity front, and in terms of the politics of it, it's, it's, it's sort of attractive uh, 
but in terms of what it actually achieves in substance, it's, it's, not, it's not that attractive. What we would say from an OECD point of view, if, if you really want to have the most efficient, least distorting way of, um, I, I guess, um, taxing wealth, property taxes are probably uh, the most efficient, least distorting way to do so. Uh, but um, a, a pure wealth tax, I mean the, the, his, I mean, the history around the world is that they're not necessarily an, a, a, a successful way of achieving the objective, the intended objective. Yeah, so I think we, we are calling this wave uh, a turning point in history, and we are in, in so many crises happening at the same time. I think as humanity, we haven't experienced that. So we are in a moment of really having to use our imagination to the maximum. And, and what has worked or not worked in the past, we, we need to really think. And, and what billionaires have wanted or not to do, you know, at the moment we're talking about, you know, the, the survival of, 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 our, of our humanity in, in the planet. So you can accumulate as much wealth as you want, but if everything um, ends around you, then, then it doesn't make much sense. So in our report out yesterday, we, we talked, we called it profiting from pain. The two years of the pandemic have been, you know, really um, a bonanza for, for lots of billionaires. And um, there's been a new billionaire every 30 hours in, in the last two years. And now in 2022, around one million people are falling into extreme poverty in, at the same rate mm -hmm. because of um, still the pandemic effects, the conflict in Ukraine, of course, inflation, everything that we know, hunger. The effects of climate are visible. So I was in Somalia uh, six weeks ago. And, you know, there are people who are used to, to coping with very, very tough conditions. But the level of impact of these droughts now are breaking all the coping mechanisms. And, and we could see hundreds of thousands of people dying. At the moment, people are dying one person every 48 seconds in Somalia, Kenya, and Ethiopia, the Horn of Africa. So... This is unfortunately only the beginning of that uh, because we're not raising enough money. The, the UN has launched an appeal for six billion. Uh, only 10% is funded. We have Yemen, Syria, the Sahel, Afghanistan. All these places are in hunger crisis and it's growing. So we really need to move and, and mobilize resources and whether it's the heart or the brain, needs to be moved to, to think of where, and, and as I said, there's huge scope in wealth taxation. It's difficult, it's been tried, and in some countries it, is, it works, and small percentages make huge difference. So we calculated 2% um, and going up to 5%. Um, um, it, it, it obviously means sacrifices, but we cannot continue in this situation, um, you know, I think, uh, as humanity, in which some people are sacrificing and giving up basically their life and others are, are thinking whether, you know, these amounts that are being accumulated are not, you cannot spend them in several lifetimes. No. Um, we can open this up for questions. So would anybody like to uh, start us off here? Um, do we have a microphone? Could we take a microphone to, to the person here? And direct it at the person you'd like to answer the question. Yeah, hi. Um, is this on? No, it doesn't. Have matter. another go? Yeah, now? We can hear you. You can hear me. Okay, great. Uh, Mehreen Khan from The Times in London. A question for the Secretary General of the OECD. Um, we spoke about the, maybe the, some of the problems that the tax agreement might have in the US, but it might not also have um, the easiest run in the EU, particularly because some parts of this will need a, uni uh, a unanimous agreement. Um, we've already seen countries like uh, Hungary blocking any deals that might require unanimity when it comes to energy embargoes. Is this something that could spill over and also threaten the progress um, of the deal inside the European Union? Thank you. Well, th thank you for the question. I mean, I'm quietly optimistic. I mean, the European Commission acted very swiftly in presenting a directive to implement uh, Pillar 2. Um, I mean, you know, it's, it's public, it's public um, uh, knowledge that Poland... Um, has been uh, expressing some concerns quite publicly. Um, the EU finance ministers are meeting today. Um, I'm quite hopeful and optimistic that there will be a resolution and that the European Union uh, will uh, implement the uh, Pillar 2 uh, as a grade. Um, and uh, as far as Pillar 1 is concerned, of course, uh, there is still uh, some technical work on the way that involves all of the parties uh, to the agreement. It's got a question from behind you. Ricardo Hausmann from Harvard University. Um, I would like to ask uh, the panel, 
especially the Secretary General, if uh, this new accord is going to make it easier for emerging and developing countries to tax uh, global income and not just uh, territorial income um, by increasing the amount of information sharing so that it would be practical for them, effective for them, to be able to tax uh, the income of their citizens abroad. Well, I mean, the short answer is, from the I said, is yes. I mean, we, we are. I mean, this this deal levels the playing field. It reduces the pressure on uh, developing economies to uh, offer wasteful uh, tax incentives. And, and and indeed, I mean, developing countries are very much part of our global uh, transparency and exchange of information approach. Um, and we are uh, also, uh, you know, putting in a dedicated effort to help develop uh, capacity. Uh, to improve the level of uh, own source revenue uh, collection, including uh, in the circumstances that you, that you mentioned. Anybody else want to come in on that point? So I think that was the original intention to really end the profit shifting and there's a lot of uh, still, you know, I, I, my understanding is it, it's still a lot of profit shifting will continue and there's large amounts coming out of Africa. So we talk about helping, but in, in the first place, it has been coming out in terms of tax that is going, going to the developed world. To the, to the yeah, yeah, but I mean, once this deal is implemented, it removes the incentive for businesses to shift profits out of those jurisdictions because, I mean, why take, why, why take the um, image, the negative image effect in order to pay the same tax elsewhere. Mm. Um, I mean, the, the sort of incentive to structure your affairs to avoid tax in those countries is removed. And in fact, the incentive for those countries to offer wasteful tax incentives or tax holidays or the like is also removed. So um, you know, are there still other issues to address as we move forward? Sure, but I think it's a significant step forward. Stephanie, um, we've got a question on, on Slido that I think would be, would be good for you to address, actually. And the question is, uh, what can be done to improve public awareness of the deal and its implications for equity, fairness and transparency? It does seem to me that um, understanding and awareness are very important when it comes to people voluntarily wanting to pay tax. Do you think the publication and, and publicity surrounding this global tax deal has been adequate to I encourage citizens to embrace the idea? That's really a great question. And uh, I think it's, um, the materials are obviously, obviously great for economists and for policymakers. I do think an outreach would be extremely helpful because it is not an easy to understand um, you know, framework. And particularly uh, what Matthias mentioned, this self-reinforcing property it has built in, which is if a sufficient number of countries move into it, it creates incentives for everyone else to try and join too. Right. And it has this self-reinforcing sort of virtuous cycle instead of the current perhaps more vicious race to the bottom cycle. Mm. And that would be something that is very useful, I think, to explain and to um, um, much more intuitively you know, say which countries are going to see actually a shift in revenues to them, both based on the changes in taxing rights and because of the minimum tax, the two pillars. Um, and so I think... Uh, you know, broader outreach and education would actually be, I think, very helpful uh, to help people understand this. Uh, uh, well, that's ball in your court, uh, Secretary General. Have you failed in your obligation to publicize and demonstrate where the revenue benefits will be felt? No, uh, well, I mean, look, we, we, we do our best and it's, uh, you know, I, I think there's always more education that can be provided. There are always more consultations and more information that can be provided. And it's a never, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a never ending finishing line. Mm. I mean, you will never quite end, reach the finish to that. But I mean, we're, we're making a lot of efforts on that front um, and we will continue to do that. And just back to, to, to where we might actually see the revenue generated at the moment. Um, the talk last year was of 150 billion additional dollars in revenue uh, as a result of the 136 uh, countries that were gonna sign up to this. Um, if we have a deep recession, what number are we talking about in reality? Um, what does the past tell us about what that figure might look like, Stephanie? You know, I wouldn't be able to tell you what the figure would look like with a recession. Maybe uh, Matthias has run different uh, scenarios here. Um, but um, obviously the, there's lots of contingencies here, both in terms of the economic situation and also which parts of this deal will be implemented and by how many countries. Right. Do you have any data? Well, no, our model? assessment is that uh, Pillar 1 will raise uh, more than $100 billion US additional 
uh, and that pillar two will rise uh, more than $150 billion a year additional. Uh, but, I mean, you know, these, these are very high-level uh, estimates. You know, obviously, all other things being equal, if you have lower growth and less... Uh, you know, lower profits, uh, you, you'll end up with less revenue. But, um, I mean, it's, it's very hard to assess that with any degree of granularity. If I say may briefly, um, looking into countries, some of the ones that haven't signed, the reasons why they haven't also is because, in fact, they'll end up losing out. And they ha currently have taxes that allow them to, to raise, for example, in Kenya, they, they can tax 89 tech companies, but under Pillar 1, now they will only be able to tax 11 companies. So there are countries that are actually losing out regardless of any economic um, downturn. Got a question here. Uh, yes, uh, Chris Giles from the Financial Times. A question for Professor Stansheva. Um, the Secretary General declined to answer your question earlier about what would happen if there was a Republican Congress for both Pillar 2 and Pillar 1. I did could you, answer it. Could you uh, tell us what you think <laughs> will happen in the US in terms of US implementation of the tax deal if we get a change in Congress? I won't be able to make predictions on that, but I think something that is quite, uh, really quite interesting in this agreement relative to other multinational agreements is what I already mentioned is that it is not necessary for all countries to agree in the first place for this to be positive, actually. Um, it is okay if a sufficient number of countries, for instance, if the EU goes ahead to create already incentives for companies from other countries to change their behavior. And it will normally have this you know, further incentive effect of other countries to jump in in order to not leave revenues on the table. And so I think this reinforcing effect is actually something quite quite peculiar, which is not always the case in multinational agreements. So my hope is that more countries will participate in this, but if only a few countries go ahead, we will still, I think, see some improvement in the multinational tax system. And, and, and just to uh, remind everyone of my answer to the question, um, I, I think my answer was that irrespective of who uh, is uh, in Congress, um, in my view, it's in the rational self-interest of the United States. Uh, to be part of this uh, deal. Um, I mean, if uh, the United States was not part of Pillar 1, uh, the risk is uh, that major U.S. companies operating globally will be on the receiving end of a um, proliferation of different uh, tax regimes and, and the inefficiency uh, that, that comes uh, from that, the double taxation risk and all of the other uh, potential issues. Much better for them to be operating in a globally consistent framework and in relation to Pillar 2, precisely as uh, you know, um, it's just been said, um, it, it's just not rationally uh, in the interest of any country not to be part of the deal once a sufficient number of countries are in it because essentially all you're doing is leaving money on the table for other countries to collect from your companies. Um, so it doesn't, that doesn't, I mean, I, I just can't, uh, from where I sit, um, I, I can't imagine that any country or any side of politics in any country would make a judgment that would... Um, put, their put themselves at that sort of disadvantage. And just finally, in relation to Pillar 1, um, proliferation of uh, unilateral measures from around the world and also the related trade tensions that come with it. Um, so, I mean, I, I think, I believe that irrespective of who is in um, the majority in Congress, who is in government, um, this is manifestly uh, in the U.S. interest and in the interest of U.S. business. David uh, Rubenstein, um, co-founder of the Carlyle Group, said on my panel yesterday not even the Democrats will vote for it after the midterms. Do you think he's wrong? Well, I have a more optimistic view. So he's wrong? Well, I, I have a different view. Yeah. So, uh, so he's wrong? Well, he, he's entitled to his opinion. He's okay. entitled to his opinion. I mean, the, only the, the truth is, right, like the, only the future will tell. Uh, my, my, uh, my view is more optimistic, but, uh, you know, I respect uh, him greatly, and, uh, you know, he's, of course, entitled to his views. Uh, we've got a couple of minutes left. I, I just want to wrap up um, uh, with a question about specific taxes. Um, we know uh, the IMF has talked about a global solidarity tax to reduce social inequality. Uh, we also know that governments have focused on specific transition taxes as a way of encouraging people to feel better about the tax they're paying because it has a specific purpose. Just as we wrap up here, just a comment from each of you, perhaps, as to whether this approach actually works and whether it's something that we should pursue at a national level to try and achieve perhaps some of the goals that you're aiming for. 
So I think it should be not only my aims, I hope there will be our collective aims because they are in the interest of the collective. I think the most immediate um, discussion on tax that is being had in several countries is windfall taxes and there is again opportunity now because of the situation in, in some sectors, the energy sector, food sector, others that have profited greatly in the last two years and the need is also great. So I would say focusing there and of course that with all the technicalities that are required, but we don't have time here, but it's, it's um, a one-off important thing. Also, there's solidarity taxes that have been introduced. Argentina did it. Um, they taxed the wealthiest in Argentina in order to have money to respond to the COVID in, in that context, where they didn't have any fiscal space. So that can be done. Um, and then there can be a societal discussion about um, wealth taxation. I think we must not really we need to continue with the ambition uh, it's not enough to to stop as where we are now windfall taxes on the energy companies good idea uh, well look i mean uh, you know we, we have said if, if there if there is um, you know I, I mean i have said publicly if there is a temporary a period during which um, certain s segments of the energy market are making windfall taxes and there is a need to provide uh, fiscal support to low income Households in order to cushion the effect, and that could be a neat temporary way uh, of, um, of of addressing the challenge. But in a, in a general sense, though, um, looking at the tax system structurally, I mean, I think it, it, it's important really for us to keep in mind that yes, governments need to raise revenue, of course, to fund the public services their populations require. That they should do so in a way that is as efficient as possible, least distorting in the economy, and which is and is seen as being fair and equitable. And if we continue to think about it in that frame. Um, then, I mean, I think that there's a lot of sensible policy reform that we can pursue. Professor? Let me talk super briefly about environmental taxes as one type of specific taxes, because, again, through this lens of how people reason about them, and what we can see across countries is that people are very aware of climate change and care a lot about it and its disastrous consequences. But what they really care about as well is that policies put in place are progressive and don't disproportionately hit lower income people and there's a perception that current policies are actually quite regressive. And so convincing people that um, climate change is disastrous, etc., is not the way to actually increase support for environmental policies, but rather having progressive policies to counter it and letting people also understand that. Just to give an example, support for a carbon tax is actually much higher if people know that the revenues are going to be rebated to the most vulnerable households or we invested in equipments to help households become greener rather than, for instance, redistributed equally or giving tax breaks more generally. Terrific. We've got to wrap it up, unfortunately. We've run out of time here, but could we just show our appreciation for our panel? And thank you very much, everybody, for being with us.